Hong Kong University Hong Kong of, Uni Sci of Science and Technology. Okay, Hong Kong the same University as Cameron. Yeah, okay, perfect. So much like him, except I also do more history. More history, right? Okay. Uh, in addition to sociology and demography. Okay, and so to start with, uh, can you tell me how you decided to become uh, an historian, an academic? Uh, so I'm um, a fourth generation uh, academic. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, my brother's a professor at uh, 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 of chemistry at Cornell. Uh, my son's a professor of medicine at Stanford. Uh, my uh, dad's uh, the first uh, Nobel laureate uh, in physics of China from 1957. Uh, and uh, uh, then my great-grandfather founded a university in China, Suzhou University. And uh, my uh, uncle was... Uh, uh, a famous agronomist, and then later on he became sort of like Minister of Agriculture for Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they called the Joint Committee of Rural Reconstruction. So he was the head of the Joint Committee of Rural Reconstruction mm -hmm. until 78 when the United States no longer recognized Taiwan. <laughs> 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 and, so, uh, and so it's always been for us, um, like going into the academy was always sort of assumed, the question we were always asked growing up was what, what field? What field, yeah. And... Uh, I went to uh, high school in Lausanne, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to the uh, Ecole Nouvelle de la Suisse Commande, the Chailly, uh, and uh, so I wanted to become a historian, a French historian. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, my dad, uh, when I told him this, uh, I think he was a little perturbed. <laughs> and so I came home maybe a month later, and he said, well, you know, look at all these lists of uh, faculty uh, from uh, University de Paris or whatever, uh, and uh, there's no Chinese person doing uh, French history. So he said, maybe, uh, you know, the French would rather the French history done by French people. So maybe you should think about doing uh, another... I was 16, I didn't know any mm -hmm. better. I would be totally manipulated by him. <laughs> and uh, so he said, why don't you think about doing Chinese history? So I said, okay. Uh, and then that's how I drifted into Chinese history. So I started that as a freshman at Yale uh, and worked as a research assistant to one of the professors there, Arthur Wright, and then uh, was recruited by Chicago to uh, become a graduate student with uh, Bindi He. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, when I graduated, I worked for 21 years at the California Institute of Technology, small university in, mm -hmm. in Southern California. I was in charge of humanities. And then I went to one of the largest universities, the University of Michigan, Mm -hmm. uh, to run their Center for Chinese Studies. And then I discovered that I really like doing humanities and social science in a school of science and technology. Mm -hmm. So, because the great thing is, is that in the school of science and technology, people don't have a strong sense of priors of what you should be doing so long as it's good work. Mm -hmm. So they're allowed more flexibility. Uh, and so... Um, they just want to see that you publish. Visibility. They care so long as you yeah. publish, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, okay. And, but the, uh, yeah, I, I, like, I like systems like that right. as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, uh, so uh, when HKUST asked me if I would be interested in looking them over, uh, Michigan was, the economy was just going downhill. Uh, it was around 2008. And so we're already, uh, we lost uh, people to other good American universities. And uh, Hong Kong was going from a three-year undergraduate to a four-year undergraduate, so you're going to hire people. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, so I went uh, there to be the dean of uh, humanities and social science, and uh, we we've done okay. So I think we're now we were originally rated about 82 in the world in social science, and now we're rated about 25. Okay. And uh, okay. so um, um, we hired some good people, and uh, and that's been a lot of fun. 
And so, so you had a, a lot of admin experience, like since since very early in your career. Right. So I've been admin for about 15, 20 years at different levels, mm -hmm. either center director or dean or, or, or head of a like a department. And so what did you learn most from, from this experience, administrating uh, universities, dealing with other academics? So, um, so what I learned is that if you really want to stay an admin and be a, um, but continue to be a professor, mm. uh, you really cannot do admin more than say half the time of the day. Mm. Mm. So you should try to find a way of working Uh, that gives you, uh, you really continue to do some intellectual work and also continue to teach because the university exists both to do research and to teach. But if you don't teach yourself, you'll gradually lose touch and then you won't be able to figure out how your unit should be doing a better job teaching. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, so I've always taught and uh, I've always had uh, graduate students. Um, And uh, so Cameron was one of my earlier uh, research assistants mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started working with me, I think, when he was 19 or oh. 20, yeah, at Caltech. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, and then you work with the good graduate students, the thing is that uh, they want to finish <laughs> and then they want a job. Mm -hmm. So you have to have work of a certain level. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then that keeps you, because you, know, you can sit in front of the screen and you can fool yourself for years <laughs> that you're being productive yeah. uh, but with uh, a kid who wants to graduate in three or four years with a PhD and get a good job that has to be very reality based yeah, yeah, yeah. and so uh, and uh, that confronts you to the networks of other academics right because if you don't, work, work. If you don't yeah. do a good job they'll leave yeah. and they'll work with somebody else yeah, yeah. and so uh, especially if you're in Hong Kong and the kid can go to Princeton or to Yale mm. or to Duke so why should they stay in Hong Kong so you have to really be on yeah. your toes and you and but I think it's been a very good experience as a result oh. so we work sort of on the keep uh, yeah and so what were your first uh, research topics so my, my original PhD was on frontier history of China mm -hmm. and uh, so that was my earliest uh, uh, sort of uh, research topic but then in the early 80s I went into social demography and population mm -hmm. history And that I did that uh, for about 20 years. And uh, then um, starting in the beginning just on China, but then later on doing comparative work. So we, we had a, a book series from MIT Press, which was just from our own research team, uh, but comparing uh, sort of uh, southern Sweden, Scania, and the Paer, and uh, Emilia Romagna, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, Italy and the Fukushima area in Japan and some areas in China doing a sort of very structured comparison. Mm -hmm. And so we had something called the MIT series in Eurasian population and family history. Mm -hmm. And we published a bunch of joint books together. And uh, then about 20 years ago, we started to do the current projects, but they took a long time to come to fruition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so now it's uh, sort of, um, uh, it's the time to harvest. Mm -hmm. and to do good work and so that's uh, so I'm no longer Dean and I'm having actually a really good time I'm just sort of writing mm -hmm. books okay. and we just finished one book in written in Chinese and we're starting a new book in English and uh, um, uh, and it has a very strong uh, kind of uh, uh, French uh, inspiration because I think um, so we do big data mm -hmm. but I think uh, Piketty's uh, um Capital of the 21st century is just a, it's a, it's a great example of really good scholarship mm. where you can take something that's inherently boring, <laughs> but then you can show that it really relates to very important sort of topic that influence mm. all of us. And uh, uh, so that's the kind of history we inspire mm. to. And so the new book is called um, uh, Understanding Inequality, a, a Chinese Comparison. Oh. Uh, sort of 1800 to 2000. So it is a kind of response to Piketty's work? Or? It's a more, it's a more uh, um, uh, multifaceted response mm -hmm. because he really looks at overwhelmingly at income and then let to mm -hmm. the extent of property. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also look at um, education and work. Mm -hmm. 
And we also look at uh, social demography, uh, sort of, uh, you know, can you get married? Can you, how long do you live? Can you have children? Mm -hmm. And so on. And then increasingly we're also looking at uh, people who work for the state, people who have political authority. Yeah, and, so, and so what is the main insight from uh, changing this? So the main insight is that if you look at the fittest, the chosen, the rich, and the powerful, it's very different <laughs> from, mm -hmm. uh, from the kind of sort of European or Western experience. Mm -hmm. And so the main, so I think one of the broader issues, you know, is uh, just the world is going more global. And the broader issue is, does that mean that we're going to become alike or mm -hmm. that we remain different? Mm -hmm. And if we're going to remain different, then where are the differences? And I think this, our work sort of seems to suggest that there are a lot of really salient differences where there's just a very different orientation. And so, so the notion of elites uh, is very important in, in this... Uh, right, so elites, uh, one of the underlying questions we have was the, is that, uh, so Piketty really suggests that um, in spite of all the change in, uh, as we go from agrarian to industrial to post-industrial to knowledge economy, that you're really looking at inherited wealth. And so you're looking at families that uh, they may change their clothing uh, from being landlord to being factory owner to being uh, financial, uh, but it's still the same families because so much of it is driven by inherited wealth. And so I think the, that's a very you know, important issue because um, uh, if our future as a species is going to be driven by increasingly a smaller and smaller proportion of the population at a time when creativity, because cognitive should be randomly distributed in a large population. Uh, there's no, you know, there's no gene for being smart. Uh, so far, it's never been found. And so, um, uh, so I think uh, China has sort of, an, uh, at least for a lot of these things, it's a kind of a, a different uh, pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, So I think that's a very important issue in terms of uh, just uh, uh, elites, elite formation, transmission of elite status to intergenerational transmission, and then the overall impact this has on uh, uh, societal, economic development, human development. Yeah. Okay. And so what, what's your feedback on today's workshop? What do you think of the talks and uh, what do you think was, was most so, stimulating or important? So I think the most important thing is that... Uh, Uh, because of Christian and the project, you have for the first time a group of people gathered together to look at this issue. Uh, and uh, it's, they've already made remarkable progress for, you know, it's only six months, right, that you're really into doing some analysis. And uh, so, you know, we have the advantage that we started decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, um, so I think the most important thing is sort of this... Uh, discovery of shared interests uh, and uh, then trying to build on this to see if we can have more shared research later. You know, uh, mm -hmm. So I was just talking to Christian about uh, like we could take a topic and we could you know, support, either we could jointly support the same student or we could support uh, different students to work on the same topic though, but uh, because I think Generally, our experience is that it's better to have projects where it's not just two professors, because professors are so busy hmm. that they may not really finish. Hmm. Whereas uh, if you have really, really good postdocs or really good graduate students, hmm. there will actually have to be a, a, a set of publications within a much shorter period of time, hmm. and so that's and that's important. Hmm. Yeah. And so, do you have some like, general advice uh, for those kind of students who are wondering whether or not academia is for them? So, I think academics is a great career. <laughs> uh, because, um, so first of all, for most careers, uh, you're so much beholden to other people because they get to say whether or not you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, whereas in the academy, there's a uh, there's a uh, um, a broader in theory there's a broader objective standard, so that uh, uh, whether you're doing a good job or not can be actually measurable by like how many people use your research, and so on, and I think that gives you a kind of autonomy that just doesn't exist. So you know you. 
you're respected, you're relatively well paid, There's, uh, the work conditions are good, uh, and at the same time, whether or not you're successful really depends on you, uh, not on your boss, and not whether your boss likes you or something. Mm -hmm. That's just so rare, because uh, um, uh, so in the world, the way the world is evolving, we have to work harder and harder and harder. You know, before it's uh, 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week. Now it's at least 70 hours a week. Uh, but uh, if you're going to have to work harder and you lose autonomy, uh, then, you know, that's, uh, that's not so nice. <laughs> so I think you get a material reward, a intellectual reward, an emotional reward. And uh, then also, as we move to this kind of period where creativity and intellectual achievement are more valued, uh, that's also, you know, that's also a good thing. So it used to be, when I started working in the academy, and this is crass, but I had no idea that you could actually be well paid. Mm -hmm. uh, professors uh, 50 years ago just weren't that well paid. Mm -hmm. And now because it's just, uh, um, for whatever reason, the, the salary of, uh, you know, sort of uh, high senior professors has really changed enormously. So the mean professor's salary hasn't changed that much, but at the high end, it's really changed a lot. Yeah, because of the competition maybe between universities and... Right, because universities and because governments are willing to put more money into the mm -hmm. academy because they believe that a lot of the future of the nation, society, and economic development depends on having these creative people. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there's just more reward. And uh, so that's, uh, that's a great thing. If, just to finish, what, what are the qualities you are looking for in the young students you decide to work with? So I think the most important thing, besides a certain level of cognitive, which you have to have, uh, is a combination of passion and flexibility. So you have to be passionate, mm -hmm. but at the same time, because you're just starting out, you have to be flexible, mm -hmm. because it's like um, you're being trained to to do something that's never been done before. So it's like a mountain where it's never been climbed before. So you cannot just say, I'm going to go on the south face and I'm going to follow this path. Mm -hmm. Because you get up halfway, you may discover that the, <laughs> it doesn't work. And you have to have the flexibility to recognize that and then to try the alternative paths. And uh, um, so when you start work, you should learn to be, therefore I think you know, a good climber is always very respectful of the mountain. <laughs> It's not about the climber, it's about the mountain. And still has a passion to climb. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty good right. Yeah, so yeah. I think you have to have the same thing in academics. You, mm. Too much of academics before was always about the researcher. Mm. And then it's just uh, an exercise in uh, you know, egotism. Mm -hmm. But I think as we move to a more objective big data, move away from the cultural, mm. it's uh, uh, there's a reality check. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people who are passionate about discovering new ways to climb the mountain, but flexible enough to really find the right path. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll do very well. Yeah. And, so it uh, became more collective, maybe. Yes, yes. So that's and I think the collective think is... flexibility, uh, too. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very important, yeah. because um, you know, how can one person, in the, in, with all this, uh, how can one person do everything? It's just not realistic. It's possible to climb the mountain alone. Right, yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. So, you know... Uh, at the very least, you need a bunch of Sherpas to help you carry everything. And then if it's a Chinese thing, they would actually, you know, build a road, have whole trucks <laughs> behind you. So, I mean, I think uh, that's very important. And, uh, and I think working as a, as a group of people also, what's so important is that, that it keeps you honest. Because our ability to fool ourselves is uh, intimate. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with the with the you have to be real. Mm -hmm.